Good morning. I welcome you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And today, a special welcome back to the choir uh, as we begin another year of ministry and, and uh, pray that the Holy Spirit will use whatever gifts that the choir will share with us to glorify God and to praise and to stir our hearts into that sense of the sacredness of life. Uh, today, we are on the last uh, Sunday of this uh, sermon series, Homeland, looking at the theme of the larger theme of home, but in the different landscapes we've considered uh, through the sermon series. And this has been based on, uh, of course, scriptures, but this book by uh, Margaret Self, Landscapes of Prayer, Finding God in Your World and Your Life. And so I, it made me think today of uh, this, uh, the, I, one of the games I love. I still look for puzzles like this. Have you ever seen, you know, a hidden object puzzle where, you know, you're looking for an object and you find it? It's, you never do them? I love... <laughs> I love those. It's just so fun, you know, to find the little objects. But in a way, it, it, this image came to my mind thinking of the theme of home, especially our home in God, and thinking that we've been looking in these different landscapes to find that object, that sense of connection. So in all the different distractions of life, in all the stuff that gets thrown at us, uh, there is that sense of finding God in these different landscapes. And today, the landscape we're looking at is the night sky. And I think it's an appropriate one to consider for us in terms of that sense of connection. Uh, I haven't met anyone who would say, oh yeah, the night sky was just ordinary yesterday. Anytime people get to experience that, they find that sense of awe. Uh, when we see sometimes even a sunset that just speaks to you or the moon. How many times have we seen the moon? But it never ceases to amaze and, and give us that sense of awe uh, whenever we are able to go out and it's not raining and it's not cloudy and you see with clarity. So today I want to invite us to prepare our hearts for worship. I invite you to take a deep breath. And to prepare us, we will use these words from Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky shows God's handiwork. So let us join in the call to worship. We gather today to worship the one who created us. The one who calls us. The one who equips us. With joyful hearts, let us worship God together. And let us uh, begin with uh, hymn number 285, God, You Spin the Whirling Planets, and I invite you to stand as you are able.
For a gratitude moment today, I would like to give thanks for the ministry and work of David Blake in our midst. We just had a reception for David, uh, and I'm sure there's plenty of food still left over in the Welcome Center. Uh, so if you haven't had a chance to, to do that, please uh, partake after the service. But we give thanks. Uh, David has been volunteering in the church office for the last four years since COVID. After, before COVID, uh, up until that point, we had paid staff uh, taking on that responsibility. But if you remember, COVID shut everything down and we weren't allowed to have pe you know, workers. And, and David came in and took over whatever needed to be handled. And it was a monumental task, if you remember those days. Everything was changing, everything was challenging, but he took it on and he's been so faithful. And I have to say, this was not my idea to celebrate his ministry. It was Nancy Post's idea. Uh, so she uh, talked to me about two or three months ago. She said, so when are you gonna thank David? There, he has a birthday coming up in August. I said, well, let me ask the elders, and that's kind of what started this whole thing. And so if you've missed it and, and you'd like to send him a note, please feel free to do that. But I'm going to share with you, in addition to being an incredible disciple, following the way of Christ, putting up with a lot of different challenges in the life of the church, David has a great sense of humor. So this week, he sent me this uh, picture. This is from... Uh, their trip, the latest trip to Lake Placid. And this is what he wrote. I was able to purchase this just by working in the church office. God does wondrous things. <laughs> and that's, you know, just a little flavor of his sense of humor and, and his sense of commitment. And so we give thanks to God. <laughs> I invite you at this time to share any prayers of joy or concern. If you'd like to share something, please raise your hand and I'll bring a microphone to you. I'm going to ask uh, prayers for Don and Corinne Iwanaki. Oh, is that, I took, okay, I won't say anything. All right. Now what am I going to say? <laughs> no, my, my first is, is this on? Okay. I think so. Okay, my first is. Uh, Maybe get it closer. My first is a concern. For Don Iwanaki. Um, he was called by the nursing home that Corinne had COVID. He took a test. It was positive, and at first he felt great, and then it hit him like a ton of bricks. So he has been very ill, uh, each day getting better. Mm -hmm. But it's very hard for him not visiting Corinne and doing all for her that he's used to doing. So he's under a lot of stress. My other is a joy. Um, thank you all for the prayers. It's been a really tough month, August. Uh, I was very ill in the hospital for a few days. Art has been, thank you God for Art. Because yes. He has been an incredible. He's, he's failed many he's, times. No. <laughs> he's, but he's learning. Yeah. He's, he's, he's a work in progress. No. <laughs> <laughs> she says it all the time. No, he has been incredible helping to take care of me. I needed a lot of care, so yeah, yeah. thank you. Yay. <laughs> we give thanks yeah, for yeah. the families in our lives who come and, you know, rescue us in times when we need the help. Um, anyone wants to, oh, Nancy, okay. Sorry. I'm happy to be here and happy to see everybody again. Haven't seen you since May. Um, today, was a special day for me to be here because today's the day to honor Dave Blake for all that he has done for this church. Mm -hmm. Whenever anybody needs anything, he's always there to help. Mm -hmm. And Nancy Brock often says, what do you say? 
What's that? David, David, David. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, well, my husband, you know, Dave worked for us. And so when I would, would you, say would anything you mind, about, would you mind sharing? When this? I would say anything about Dave um, doing something in the office, Bill would say, David, David, David. He was obviously <laughs> jealous. <laughs> Nice. I'm just glad to be here, and I just want to say that my husband, David, is doing well, but he's very particular about getting out, but I'm here for both of us. We're glad you're here. Yay. Yay. Um, Michael, and I was wondering if one of you would uh, say anything about the golf tournament, too. I'd like prayers for my cousin Vicki who lives in Iowa. She has cancer, she's gone through chemo, she received her last treatment probably about three weeks ago. Then didn't feel well, she thought she just had the flu. Mm. Come to find out she had COVID and pneumonia. Mm. So they put her in the hospital. So just prayers for her and for her husband Terry, you know, that she continues to strengthen and that um, they are both very strong in their faith and she says what happens gonna happen amen we'll pray for her um nancy do you want to say anything about the golf tournament yesterday well the golf or kelly or, yeah kelly would you kelly know. or no nancy did it <laughs> Na nancy was there too i'll just say sorry she's a target it. always <laughs> I, I was there not as a golfer but um to help a little bit and it went very well and we had a wonderful time it's a great day of fellowship and fun and good food, and uh, I think very successful. Great. For the most part, I, I think it went very well. Do you have Kelly knows more of the details. <laughs> Kelly, do you have anything to report? She did great. <laughs> she did great. Okay. It was a great day, despite the rain and the, you know. And Carol, Carol bought seven baskets. She she overbid me. We were, I, we were in a bidding war yesterday. I kept going into the table. I wanted to. There was a. There was. By the way, you want to say anything about your syrup? Oh yeah. yeah. That's what caused the problem yesterday. All right. <laughs> so the talk of the day yesterday. <laughs> Um, the bidding war between Carol and Rula was on the mountain maple syrup basket. Uh, we had our, this was our first year making maple syrup, and we entered our amber and dark into the New York State Fair. We got fourth place in the dark, but we got first place in the state for our amber, so we were very excited. So Very nice. Um, uh, Michael just brought up, too, that uh, along with the golf tournament yesterday for our outreach and um, committee, Emily Holt Scholarship, uh, Crossroads House, um, those are all the things that they benefit. Um, in addition to the golf tournament, we um, also are running the mom sale. Today is the last day of that if anybody still needs vouchers, but that also was a very good uh, fundraiser for us. So thank you everyone who Great. chipped in on that. Yes. But beautiful day yesterday. Even despite the rain, the sun would come right out. You know, we'd be frozen to the bone going, oh, why are we golfing in this? And then the next minute the sun would be shining and it was wonderful. So, and the dinner afterwards, it was just, I don't know, I thought it was like the best tournament mm -hmm. that we've had, not number wise, but just, it was just so fun to be there. Great, so. great, thank you. So if you're into syrup, maple syrup, they have maple syrup that's really good. So I ended up having to buy the syrup separately and then she gave me a gift of syrup because well, I <laughs> you did it again you just took that right out of my mouth <laughs> i was i was gonna say could we get together <laughs> i was gonna say kelly is a wonderful businesswoman because we did not realize we were the two numbers bidding against each other and i was getting it for my son the kids love maple syrup i didn't know it was mountains she was getting it for david blake so Kelly came to our rescue. I bought the basket. She made up another one for Rula to buy for David Blake. So <laughs> you go, girl. You are a real businesswoman. Five hundred dollars later, I was like, "Who's who's bidding like this?" I, <laughs> and and someone was actually concerned. Is Rula using the church money? I'm like, no. That's like a major sin in the Presbyterian Church to, you know, bid and ga any game of chance, we're very opposed to that in general. Any other prayers? Oh, yes, Kelly. Um, just 
uh, prayers for next Sunday. I won't be here. Um, we have a group of probably 20, at least 25 people walking in the kidney walk um, for, Leslie. for Leslie. And she's planning on walking with us. Nice. And then just a couple weeks after that, October 2nd is her kidney transplant, so prayers. And, yep, and my sister Kim made it through the first two radiations. We got three more this week, and she's doing great, so. Great. Yes, we will continue to hold Leslie Tanner in, in our prayers and your sister Kim as well. And so we pray. We give you thanks, O oh God, for your loving presence in our lives, for the many ways you bring joy to us through this community of faith. Help us to remember that this joy is the gift of your spirit that sense of bonding, the sense of being your children is something that we can gift to the world as well in places of suffering, in places of strife, in places of uh, divisive politics and hate. We can bring that sense of being your people, that we're all connected through the power of your spirit. Help us as we celebrate, as we pray for the different people, as we give thanks, as we also plead for those who are suffering, to always be mindful of your presence, to know that you are the force uh, behind all of life, that you bring that sense of newness, even in the worst of places. Help us to trust that. Help us to live it and to proclaim it. And now we come before you in a few moments of silence to bring our hearts before you. And we continue in prayer using the words our Lord Jesus Christ taught us to pray, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Amen. And that's a great reminder. Wherever we experience love, we are experiencing God's spirit because God is the source of all love. And so today we are looking at finding a sense of home and a sense in uh, connection through the night sky, the homeland of s uh, landscapes that speak to us. And to begin, I want to share with you, and it's a, it's a little disturbing, but I want to share with you a little clip from an NPR interview that I heard on the radio. And this was with a uh, person who identifies as a Christian nationalist. And so, um, and does PR, so basically speaks for the groups that are involved in this, in this movement. So let's listen to this. Maybe there isn't the radio piece. You, you got it? Okay. Is one of God. Okay, sorry. Christian nationalism is a movement that has gained momentum in conservative circles in recent years. The basic idea is one of government and religion, specifically Christianity, that is way more explicit and intense than it has typically been the case throughout American history. A new public radio podcast takes a look inside the Christian nationalist movement. It's called Extremely American Onward Christian Soldiers. Here's host Heath Drusen and reporter James Dawson from Boise State Public Radio. Hey, Gabe. How you doing? Welcome. This is, uh, this is our... Obviously. I'm talking to Gabriel Wrench, a media personality and activist in Idaho. Most people call him Gabe. Okay, great. Gabe has a lot of ideas about how America should change. You said it would probably take a long time, but that you would like to see only Christians be able to, to run for office. So if you're Jewish, if you're Muslim, if you're atheist, certainly... Uh, if I had you right, you said that, yes, you would you would support eventually the, them not being allowed to run for office. That's correct. I, I did say that. Because Gabe is a proud Christian nationalist. I think that the Christian faith is the ideal uh, moral doctrine and principles for a thriving society. And the farther you get away from that, the more in chaos we descend. And so I, I, the only way to maintain that, or one of the ways to maintain that, is you have to have people who are running for office who believe that. Um, or you're going to get back into that chaotic decline. So I'll, I'll tell you straight up, um, as a Jewish American, um, I hear that, that I can't run for office, uh, other non-Christians can't. And, and I have to admit, it's a little terrifying to me. Um, because to me, that means a fundamental freedom of mind in this theoretical world is gone. Well, I mean, you're saying that in a country where you experience all these immense freedoms that was built on the Christian faith, so... Um, but I, but I, where I can run for office right now. Um, yeah, because your worldview is not good for society. All right. You know, this is kind of... And then maybe there is a mix of reactions to this. But I thought to myself, what would, what would lead somebody to believe that only their version of faith and connection to God is the only way? Uh, what would lead somebody to consider that the expansive way of Jesus can be limited to one group? And by the way, at the end of the interview and all of that, so Catholics are not included, definitely Presbyterians are not included in this uh, Christian kind of. So it's a narrow segment also of the Christian faith. It's not, we're not talking about um, all Christians. We're talking about a small uh, group because we don't tend to hold the same. I mean, we have maybe some of the basic uh, teachings, but we see things very differently about social issues and, and uh, the teachings even of Jesus and how we take them. So I thought today it's a good consideration of, we're talking about the expansiveness of God. And we're looking at one way that people look and think of God in this little box. What, what's your sense of, of this? Well, any reactions to this? I know it's kind of a tough time, especially now that we're in the election season and there's a lot of politics and a lot of divisiveness. But from a Christian point of view, your experience of God, how does it resonate with you or doesn't resonate with you, this message? That only Christians can run for office. Uh, 
I totally disagree. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us how you feel about this, Ruth. <laughs> Don't hold back. My, my faith tells me that God is a God of love. Mm -hmm. And I don't believe you can limit God's love or God. And that's what, to me, mm -hmm. these people are doing. And I'm not sure they're aware of it, but to me, it's a whole way of life that they're pushing. And one of the things, one of my favorite problems is that men think they're the most wonderful things and <laughs> should rule everything, okay? Whoops. And women should stay home and raise the kids and wash the dishes, okay? All right. <laughs> Don't listen to this art. <laughs> um, and I, I totally disagree with that. I, I mean, to me, they have such a limited vision of God and mm -hmm. God's love, mm -hmm. for that matter, that it just makes me angry. Sorry that you came to church for a little bit of anger, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I, I do have a, a perspective on this, and I'll, I'll share it in a minute, but I, I'm really appreciating that you're willing to share. Um, here's what I'm willing to share. I was at several lunchtime Bible studies with Bob Kaiser. Mm -hmm. And we got into a rather heated discussion based on biblical writings. And it was judgmental toward certain people. And I loved how Bob settled it. He said, you know what I honestly believe, and if you knew Bob, I mean, mm -hmm. boy, there's only, there was only one Bob. He said, I believe that the Bible says, let us love one another. And he said, I think that's what we should do, and we should let God do the judgment call. Mm -hmm. You know, and then the room was quiet, and we moved on to another topic. But I've never forgotten that, and especially this day and age where if we all try to understand and accept, maybe not understand even, mm -hmm. but accept the differences and love people in spite of the differences, right. and let God, let God take care of the judgment call. Thank you, Bob Kaiser. Yes, Bob Kaiser. Great man. You know, it's funny. I remembered Bob Kaiser today with David Blake uh, because he would tell me, you know, David Blake and his brother do all this stuff, all this work for their church. They were raised right. And, you know, uh, there is a lot of wisdom. He would have these little sayings reminding you of what really matters. But I think one of the big flaws of any, any theology that takes you to think, you know, only the one way is that we forget that faith is really not about a doctrine. As much as we like to think, you know, only if I get these 10 doctrines together or I believe these 10 things, faith is about that relationship with God. It's about that sense of connection. Because one of the greatest illusions in life is that we're separate from God. How many of you have experienced that sense? Be honest, where you feel alone. You feel like God is not there with you. I certainly have. It's an, it's an illusion. Sometimes even when we pray, we, you know, God, we beseech you to come and be with us as if God was separate somewhere else. Sometimes, you know, we have um, a beginning prayer and a, and a meeting and someone says, you know, God, please come and be with us or bless this meeting. God has already given us the blessings that we need. What we need is the awareness. What we are missing is the awareness that we are connected to God all the time. There is no such thing as a time without God. And at the same time, we're connected to one another and all of creation. And that's kind of the hardest piece with limiting the faith to doctrines and moral teachings. I'm not saying faith doesn't lead you to become more moral. Definitely, you learn to appreciate that lying is not good for anyone, that not telling your truth and, and not living authentically, not loving your neighbors, not caring about the hurt of others, these are not ways to happiness. But at the end of the day, 
the core issue is that connection to God, that sense of connection, that sense of home, which is hard when you start parsing it into little boxes. You know, I know uh, some churches, and even in our own tradition, there was a time when, you know, you had to, pe to say these things. Even today, for pastors, you know, in order to pass, you know, as we speak about Craig Kunkel, some of you know Craig, who is being uh, sponsored by our church and as uh, someone who's going through the ordination process. He, uh, he just went through uh, the Bible exam. He preached here, by the way, a couple of weeks ago. But anyway, he, uh, I asked him, how did that go? Great. I said, so what do you, what's, what's next? Well, I have to do the exegesis and all these other exams. And he said, get this, the text for this year for uh, the exam is from Leviticus. I'm like, wow, good luck with that. It's tough. So we have these standards and we sometimes confuse the standards. Of course, we should have standards, but we sometimes confuse them to be the faith. There are things that are a result of the faith. They're about that deep connection with God. And so today I want to invite us to consider, you can't really argue with people and go and think, you know, if I could just tell them, if I could just prove to them this is not right, if I could just pull out a Bible verse and tell them, you know, it says it here because they'll have 10 other Bible verses that, you know, and you, you don't get anywhere. What we're, or we end up avoiding topics that are difficult with our friends and neighbors or family members. The invitation is to engage it with the spirit of God's, uh, of God's love and expansiveness. So um, I call it the gift of the night sky for us. So if you have those moments of awe, usually one of the big things that people share is that I felt so connected to the world. You know, I don't hear people saying, you know, when I saw the night sky, I felt like only my tribe is the most important thing in the world. Usually it's, wow, there was this incredible moment of sensing the mystery of God, sensing that God is so much bigger than we can ever imagine or feel or know. And so Margaret Self writes this, it is a rare human soul who is not stirred by the night, by the sight of the night sky. Astronomers estimate that there are about 100 billion stars in our own galaxy. The numbers confound all of our senses and overload our minds, circuitry. And so she says, when we reflect on our faith in God, this vast context, then there is no way we can confine God to our tiny man-made boxes of understanding. But God is inviting us not to be overwhelmed by all this wonder, but to allow it to draw our gaze beyond ourselves and our passing pleasures and irritations towards a reality infinitely greater than anything we can imagine, yet a reality that is intimately engaged with every moment of our lives. So what she's saying is that, you know, we, these experiences of awe, these experiences of the night sky, they remind us that we are tiny, we are important, yet we are also a small part of a great mystery that we can never really get totally under control. As much as we like to control, uh, because that's what it is. It's sometimes, you know, it's easy to say, well, okay, if you believe this way, and, you know, the church is guilty like any other group of human beings. If you behave this way, or if you say these prayers, or if you do these things, or if you give 10% of your income, or whatever it is that, you know, we put these conditions, these are the secondary pieces. These are the, the things that should be byproduct of the faith. The first is that experience of awe. It's not the don't, don't put the doctrines and the teachings and your understanding as the primary focus of the faith because that doesn't usually transform people. It actually makes us more rigid. Have you ever tried that when people tell you certain foods? So only if you eat these kinds of things are you going to, I mean, do, do you watch those ads, by the way, that pop up? Um, on, oh, you know, you just need to eat this food and then you'll lose weight or you'll, your cholesterol will get better or your liver, whatever it is. 
And usually it doesn't work. I mean, people try it, we fall for it, and most diets, by the way, they don't work. Honest truth, this is, this is science-based. Most diets don't work. Does it mean that we shouldn't try to eat well? Of course, but the motivation should be the one that we're examining. What's going on with me that I have to, to eat so much sugar? What's, what's missing in my body or what am I, what am I, I mean, syrup, speaking of that, here I am bidding wars on, <laughs> on syrup. But think about it, what is going on with, in, with our bodies? And the same thing with our spirits. When we feel that need to control the certain beliefs and to control life and to control everything around us, when life is supposed to be a journey of trust, that's what faith is about. It's about trust. It's about trusting the mystery of life, the things that are unseen, that cannot be seen with the eye, that cannot be controlled. When we make it about the things we can control, we definitely miss what God is about. And so the Bible gives us these stories of encounters where people have had that transformation. So we're going to look at a few of them. Abraham and his uh, experience of God, uh, expanding his vision from thinking of his tribe. You know, he, he follows the call and then God gives him the promise that he's going to have a lot of children. But then his wife doesn't get pregnant and he's questioning and yet, the promise was still there. And so out, you know, goes Abraham into the night sky. And then he hears that message that, you know, your descendants are going to be as numerous as the stars. And it was hard to believe at that at the moment. But the experience itself led him to continue in the faith. It wasn't just a conviction of his mind. It was the stirrings of his heart. The same was true of Jacob. Jacob was a trickster. He cheated his brother. He did all kinds of shady things. And so he's running for his life. And it's a night. He has to sleep and use a rock for his pillow. And then he has this encounter with an angelic being. And then he wrestles all night with this angelic being. And when he wakes up, he has a limp. He's limping because he had a problem with his hip because of the wrestling. And then he realizes that wrestling was about God's presence with him, even in the worst moment of his life, even when he was feeling, you know, if you had those nights, restlessness, you turn on this side to this side and it hurts, and then you turn to the other side and it, after a while it hurts, or your mind keeps going and going and you can't stop worrying and thinking. Those are human experiences of not really feeling that deep sense of connection. And all of a sudden, when you say that little prayer of saying, God, I can't, I can't do anything about this, the peace that passes all understanding comes over you, and you have that presence. And it changes everything. Another one is the shepherds. Those are lowly in the story of the birth of Jesus. They're out there uh, watching their sheep. And what happens? They have this encounter. And they are told about the birth of Jesus. And they go to praise and to worship. I mean, these are the people that nobody would believe their witness because they're out there, as I said, the lowest of the low. But somehow, within their spirits, they find it in themselves to go and to proclaim. And they become part, an important part of the story. And then there's the Magi, the wise men. They follow a star, and they follow a star because they had some kind of connection to the Spirit of God. And I love this part of the story, of the Christmas story, because it reminds us that these people didn't end up converting to being Jewish. They went back to their own homes. They practiced their own religion, but yet they, their faith was important to the story of God's love. And so there's every one witness after the other. And today we are looking at the Psalm 139. It's a wonderful psalm. We often pray it as a personal psalm. But when we think of the psalms, I often remind you of the time when they were collected or written. It was believed that they were orally uh, said and prayed, but 
the context for collecting these prayers was the exile. It was an experience of decimation, or an experience of disorientation. These people were, had lost their home. They were exiled into Babylon. Uh, everything came into question. Everything they held dear, it seemed like God had abandoned them. And yet, in faith, they proclaim these uh, affirmations because they have had those experiences. I love that Psalm 137, we hear about the people of Israel sitting by the rivers of Babylon and weeping and remembering their life as a people before the exile. So fast forward a couple of chapters. They're in this place of affirmation, the mysteries of God. And there's this uh, scene of the darkness and the night sky being seen as full of God's light. So let's listen to, this, uh, to a part of this psalm from uh, Margaret Self. It, she paraphrases it. Oh God, you know every cell in my being. Every movement I make, every thought that my mind shapes, every aspect of who I am and how I am. Before I utter a word, you know it already, and your hand rests upon my breath. Such knowledge amazes me, probing depths I dare not contemplate, soaring to heights I can never hope to reach. Where would I go to flee from your gaze? And why do we want to flee from God's gaze? Why do people do that? It's like, oh, we feel like we are so far away. Is there anywhere that your presence does not suffuse? If I fly to the skies, you are there. If I sink to the depths of, my, of despair, you are there. If I speed off on the wings of the dawn and find a resting place beyond the horizon, even there, your hand would guide me and your, your arm hold me firm. I beg the darkness to envelop me and the night to wrap itself around me. This is beautiful poetic language when you think of sometimes life being difficult. I want the darkness to just swallow me up, basically saying. But even darkness is not dark to you, and with you, night is as bright as day. You created my innermost self, weaving me into being in my mother's womb already aware of every secret that my life would hold. Lord, Lord, it is impossible to fathom your thoughts. They are as many as the grains of sand upon the shore. Even if I could ever finish counting them, there I would be still held within your heart. So there is Bob Kaiser's piece. It's beyond our comprehension. And it's an incredible affirmation when you think the time of decimation, of disorientation, of the exile, the people are feeling at the lowest moment of their existence as the people of God. Yet there is this affirmation and the prayer. Have you ever prayed sometimes prayers of faith when you really didn't feel them? You say, God, I trust you. But everything in you says, oh, I don't trust you. I don't trust you at all. I feel so abandoned. But you're, you say these prayers, and the more you say them, the more you connect. I think that's the mystery of faith. That's the power of faith, is that it shapes us, it transforms us, it, it changes who we are. If faith confirms only what you already are, it's not faith. It's just a belief system. And you could replace that with any new fad or old fad. I mean, there are times when we just think that faith is only about what I think. What about that deep sense of connection? What about what really changes you? It's kind of like the experiences we have in our own families, in our own communities. You could be really angry with someone, and then you find them caring about someone you love changes you. It makes you look, you know, this person that I think is just the devil is doing something really godly and loving. And then you start to see them in a different light. Or if you have experienced sometimes a disconnect with, with some people. And then you, you come and you say, you know what, let's work together on, on a project we can, we can make a, a difference with. 
then all of a sudden things start shifting. Or you hear their life story and their struggles. You hear where, what, where they've been hurt, where they're afraid. And sometimes we hear ourselves when we're being so protective of ourselves because we've been hurt or we've been afraid or something really got to us to trigger an emotional response that's not based in love. So all of this to remind us that nothing is outside of God's realm or presence. And I love the mix of the personal God, but also the vast God, the God that expands everything in your life, the God that throws the doors open to your heart, to your life. Um, sometimes I find myself praying and saying, God, I'm done growing. Okay, we're good. I've, I've grown enough. But that's not how it works. If you're still alive, if we're still alive, we're going to continue to grow. We're going to continue to allow the Holy Spirit to continue the work. And sometimes the uh, churchy word is sanctification. You know, you're always being sanctified. You're always being brought to that sense of holiness. It's not about you being bad and becoming good. It's about returning to who you really are in your essence. All that bad stuff is like that picture I showed you, you know, the hidden object picture. You know, all the stuff that gets thrown at you, the grudges, the problems, the challenges, the prejudices, the bigotry, all of that comes from society. In your heart, it's not who you are, it's not who we are. People who uh, experience the love of God in a transformative way are rarely people that trans transmit hate and fear and, and that sense of, you know, your life doesn't matter because you don't believe like me. So I, I pray that you will take this uh, experience, this prayer today, and to think about it, this, this uh, prayer from the psalm, to think about it not just for yourself. So we, it tends to, to sound like it's very personal. You have created me. You have done this for me. But maybe replace the me part with that person's name or that group's name that you resent, that you see as useless, that you see as, you know, hell-bent on, on destroying the country or destroying the world. It's hard work. But in the realm of God, there's nothing that is impossible. In the realm of God, we can reach, we can work for justice, we can challenge the systems that oppress, but we can never forget the humanity of others. We can never forget that they are too created in the image of God. And that night sky experience, whatever you, wherever you've had it, can bring you back to that, to your senses. You know, if you had that experience where you're so upset, you're so angry, you're seething. I mean, Ruth, you, you were displaying that for us. You listen to that, and you're like, ah, what is this? But then the night sky comes, and then you start saying, whoa. God loves everyone. God loves the whole world. I don't know how God does it, but that's the mystery of life and faith. That's the story of Jesus. I love that story after story after story. Jesus takes, you know, those people that people thought they were worthless or people that thought they were enemies. You know, the tax collector, the rich Pharisee, the people that were seen as, you know, they talk badly about you. They don't think highly of you. Every person was part of his story. And it wasn't out of weakness. Jesus was not, you know, sometimes we make him sound like he's just weak. I think it takes a lot of strength to be in a place of love in the face of hate. Think about it. It's so easy to go to a place of hate, isn't it? It comes to us so easily. When somebody says something mean to you or does something, that's really not, not good. Is it easy to to love them? Is it easy to stay in that place? And I'm not saying it's a permission giving kind of experience where you say, oh yeah, keep saying that stuff. Yeah, I deserve to be mistreated like that. Yeah, step all over my boundaries. It's okay. It's not that. It's about staying in that place and not engaging it from a place of hate and anger and resentment and not holding on to it. I mean, sometimes you see families, you know, when was the last time you spoke to your sister or to your brother? Oh, 30 years ago. 
what was the issue? Well, and then they tell you the issue, and they're like, oh, is it really worth 30 years of anger? But we do that, and it's not uncommon. I mean, nations do it to each other. What's happening in Ukraine right now? Well, it's a grudge playing out. Same is between the Israelis and the Palestinians. Can't come to, a, to an agreement because we keep holding on to that pain and not able to see beyond that, to see that to the grace of God. I was actually at the farmer's market on Friday, ran into one of the members of the Jewish community uh, here in Batavia, and I said, well, I haven't seen you for a while. How are you doing? Oh, there was a sigh. I'm like, what, what's going on? She said, well, I really, I'm struggling in these times because there's a lot of fear for the Jewish people in this country right now. And she was saying that they, uh, since they closed the temple here in Batavia, they go to Rochester for the high holidays um, and high holy days. Um, but she said it's, it's not a building that has any signage on it. It's undisclosed location, and it's only by word of mouth. I'm thinking we're living in these times. It's so sad. And, and she was asking about the Mindful Mondays uh, practice that we have. I'm hoping she's going to come tomorrow. She said, is that exclusively Christian? I said, well, we use the Psalms, so I think you'll be fine with that. I said, we really try to be... Um, you know, ha offer the time to be a meditation time, and, and we do some energy medicine work beforehand. So I hope you will come. She said, I'm longing for a community of faith, but I'm so fearful. It just it, it boggles the mind that we live at, at, at times when people do this. And, and if you had asked somebody from uh, the side that is oppressing and that's preaching hate, if you really got to know them, usually they're good people. They're really nice people. I mean, it's, it, that's been my experience. You get to know the person, you're like, what? why are you? I mean, have you had that experience with, I had that recently. Somebody was um, uh, riding a motorcycle and ah, just really nasty driving and, you know, doing this stuff. And then the guy gets off and I got to see him he takes his helmet off I'm like you look like a normal person why are you acting like that on the motorcycle what happened uh, it's just the way we uh, we I mean we all fall short of the glory of God and that's why we need these reminders we need the prayers we need the stories of faith we need the reminders to look up to look at the night sky, to see our neighbors as our kin, to see the people across the world as our kin, to see every person as deserving of God's love. And so uh, one of the affirmations I want to leave you with is a scientific one. Um, Neil deGrasse Tyson, who doesn't have faith, but often talks about this concept, we are made of stardust. And I love that because, you know, from a astrophysicist point of view, he talks about the connection to the stars. What we have in our blood, the iron you have in your blood, is the same stuff of the universe. We are connected in ways we, even from a, a cellular kind of point of view, we are connected to the greatest mystery of life. So I invite you to live with that, to explore it, to see, to see how God could bring healing and love to whatever division and hate that you experience in this world at this moment. And I bless you to do that in the way of Jesus Christ. Amen. So we'll close with hymn uh, number 281, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah.
And friends, when all your prayers are prayed, stand beneath the stars and give your soul permission to travel beyond all words into the living, loving heart of silence. And never forget that you are made of stardust. Amen. And so please turn to your neighbors and greet them with the peace of Christ. Thank you. 